Welcome to one more edition of Politics and Radam Egberto Willis, your host. Thank you so kind of for being a part of our show. Again, we have a great guest to, to bring you today. You know what we talk about a whole lot, speaking to all sides, being able to communicate very well on all sides. Well, this is the man. Isaac Saul is the founder and editor of Tangle, an independent, ad-free, nonpartisan newsletter that has been recognized by the New York Times, Forbes, and Substack as one of the most successful political newsletters. Tangle has over 30,000 daily readers and presents a left-right breakdown of the biggest political news stories of the day. You got to check it out with the goal of representing the best arguments from both sides of the aisle. Welcome to Politics Done Right. Isaac, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having me. I'm glad to be here. Well, look, first of all, tell me a little bit about yourself. How did you get started, etc.? Sure. Yes. Uh, I'm a political journalist. And, uh, you know, I came to this work by publishing my writing, my opinions, my investigative journalism, my straight news reports in a v wide variance of news outlets. And over time, realizing that people essentially trusted or listened to what I was writing based solely on the outlet that it was being published in. So, you know, I could write the same piece in Fox News and Huffington Post. And if it was in Fox News, no liberal would read it or care about it or trust it. And if it was in the Huffington Post, no conservative would read about it or care about it or trust it. And I decided that I wanted to try and bridge the gap a little bit. And, you know, I think there's a lot of problems with the current media ecosystem. And one of them is that we're not honest about our biases as journalists. Uh, another one of them is that, you know, depending on what news outlet you read, you're almost certainly going to get basically just one side of the story. And so I came up with this concept to just put what the right is saying, put what the left is saying right next to each other, let you read both of those things, come to your own conclusions, add a little bit of my own commentary, some basic facts about the story too, and then kind of take it from there. I love, I, I, I simply love that because I hate to say that's what I do. You know I mean? We, 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 <laughs> I, I, I'm a, I'm a lefty, but the truth of the matter is a lot of my audience are people on the right because of the honesty with which I accept what I believe in. And I accept what they, the, the, accept that they believe what they believe. And I think that's important. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I kind of have a hunch where you your persuasion is. I'm not quite sure, especially after write, writing that particular Huffington Post article about Hillary Clinton. I thought it was, <laughs> you know, I was going to hit that one. Uh, yeah. But, you know, I, I but I mean, it was honest. And, and that is what I think people people like. I think people probably enjoy that. Uh, it's it's not about what you say. It's about whether what you're saying is fact based or whether you're honest with the belief that you have your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, what I like to say is that, uh, you know, I'm politically incongruent. I don't fit into one box, you know? I mean, the story you're referencing is a piece I wrote, uh, I guess, seven, six or seven years ago now in 2016, leading up to the election, where I basically, you know, apologized for some really critical writing I had written about Hillary Clinton. I'd, I'd sort of excoriated her and then gone back and said, you know what, maybe there's more merit to her candidacy than I had thought. But, you know, over time, my politics have evolved on a lot of issues, especially as I've grown up and seen more of the world. And uh, I think what, what, I, what I typically say to people is, you know, it just depends on the issue. Sometimes people subscribe to Tangle on a Monday and they reply to the newsletter that day and they say, you said you were nonpartisan, but, you know, I can tell you're a liberal from your take in today's newsletter. And then the people who sign up on Tuesday will say, you say you're nonpartisan, but I can tell you're a secret conservative based on your take in today's newsletter. And it's because, you know, it just depends on the issue. And I think a lot of Americans are like that. I think a lot of people don't fit neatly into one political box. And I'm trying to say, you know, that's okay. It's all right to, it's all right to dunk on your team every now and then. It's all right to change your point of view on something if you see a good argument for it. And it's okay to say, you know, I'm not a Democrat or a Republican. And I think that that's becoming more and more popular today. I mean, independents are now the largest self-identified political group in America. And it's for good reason, because, uh, you know, the, the two major parties are both deeply flawed right now. Yeah, they're absolutely and deeply thought. Now, interestingly, you said something about um, the, the, you know, not being a partisan. I, I, don't, I don't consider myself a partisan. I consider myself, however, believing in a particular ideology. And I think what's interesting is 
most of the people in this country believe they believe in my ideology and i would i would i would proffer your ideology as well which is whatever is good for the vast majority of people whatever whatever the policies are and you know most of the times those policies appear in one section but every so often it appears somewhere else as well and you have to be brave enough to to point that out and i think in your writings that is your later writings that is something that you prove your thoughts on that Look, I mean, I think, uh, you know, progressives are called progressives for a reason and conservatives are called conservatives for a reason. I mean, one side is trying to change the country and reform it in a lot of ways. And the other side is trying to prevent change and hold on to certain things from the past. And I think there are great things about our country and our country's founding and, and the status quo. And there are really bad things about it, too. And, and that, to me, is sort of what both sides kind of bring to the table and offer in a really helpful and valuable way. Um, you know, I think what, one of my positions right now that is sort of evolving or I'm reflecting on a bit more is that I have for a long time been a huge critic of our military defense budget and how big it is and how bloated it is and how much money we spend on guns and tanks and airplanes and bases in other countries when our schools are falling apart and all these things. And then, you know, I watched Ukraine get invaded by an authoritarian leader this, this month. And I have to admit, it, I, it occurred to me, I'm really, really glad that I know this would never happen in the United States because we're the biggest and the baddest and nobody's going to come for us. And it was the first time in my life I've ever really second guessed that political view of mine. And I'm trying to reflect on it with an open mind right now. And I think, you know, more Americans should be open to that and open to changing their opinions and thinking about it because, you know, I, I think the vast majority of people are well-intentioned. And while most politicians are very interested in preserving their power, there are a number of really decent, good politicians on both sides of the aisle who are trying to do what they think is, is good for the country. Now, you opened a door that I, I, I would like for you to maybe write some, some about, and I'd, be, I'd love to get that newsletter myself and, and post it. But you made an interesting point that uh, Ukraine really sort of make you, made you rethink your 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 process your thought process on big military and you know i i you know there's for me that's neither here and there other than uh sh should we look at it from the point of view like okay i'm glad that there's still a big military as opposed to why can't we do both or even that uh maybe some is overkill your thoughts yeah i mean i think you know i i guess first of all it's something i'm still processing a little bit and so i'll i'll caveat everything i'm about to say with that but you know, I think it's just that I'm I'm realizing that our safety and our security as a country is something that I often take for granted and that a lot of countries across the planet don't live with that safety and don't live with that security. And the reason that we have that safety and that security is because we have the biggest and the most well-funded military in the world. And most countries recognize that it would be a suicide mission to to invade us or to, you know, really mess with us even on the world stage. Now, of course, that doesn't change my view that a lot of the, the military explorations that we've taken from Iraq to Afghanistan to funding Saudi arms, all these things, I still view very negatively. I mean, I don't think we should be spending our military money on projects in other nations, quote unquote, you know, spreading democracy with bombs. But I do, I think for the first time, really recognize why so many people, why so many conservatives in particular support such a huge military budget, which is that they recognize that there are a lot of threats out there in the world and it's better to be safe than sorry. And, um, you know, just watching the events of the last few weeks have, have made me reflect on that a little bit. You know, um, today I got a message from, uh, from a good friend that we participate in several um, uh, organizations, nonpartisan org organizations, that is, and one of the questions that she asked, and um, this, this isn't any kind of a, 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 a gotcha or anything, but I, I would love to hear your opinion on that because I gave an opinion. I'm, I'm pulling it up as we speak, if it'll decide to come up someday, somehow, sometime. But I'll, I'll caveat the question and say it this way. She said, is journalism, uh, should, is, has, it says, should journalistic objectivity be standard reporting your thoughts on 
should I'm going to give you my answer after, but I'm curious to see how you would interpret that question. Yeah, it's a, it's a huge question our industry is facing right now. And my answer is that no journalist is truly objective. There are fair journalists and there are hacks. And I think it's really important to separate the two. I think it's important to separate the reporters out there who clearly have a political agenda, who are willing to obscure the facts or spread misinformation in order to tell the story they want to tell. But I know a lot of liberal and a lot of conservative journalists, people who openly wear their politics on their sleeves, who are also really great, fair reporters that will go out and cover a story and do it fairly. And I think there's a lot of honor in the work that journalists do when it's done right. And the best reporters feel a great deal of responsibility to try and tell a story that's true and honest and holistic. And so, you know, it's not always easy to decipher, but uh, one of the things I like to remind people is, look, even the most liberal journalists in the world are often the ones who are most critical of their team, of the Democratic Party. I mean, they're the ones who write the hardest hitting stories about the president who is a Democrat because they expect the highest of that president. Um, the, the famous example, in my opinion, is you know the New York Times, widely seen as a left-wing newspaper now, is the paper that broke the story on Hillary Clinton's emails. They're the paper that has covered Obama's drone wars in the Middle East. You know, two of the biggest stains on two of the biggest Democrats in the country came from the New York Times, which is supposed to be a paper that is, you know, a left-wing paper. And um, you just never know how it's going to play out. You know, I, 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 first of all, I agree with absolutely everything that you said. I want to read two short paragraphs that I told her, and I want you to comment on that if, and, and, and expand on it, actually. I said, should journalistic objectivity, uh, standard reporting, yes, but journalistic objectivity has never existed to be begin with journalists and or their producers choose the stories they cover and the stories they cover even if they are simply reporting occurrences without opinion illustrate subjectivity as an example figure out all the violent crime in any given city then watch the local news do the protagonists of said violent crime on the six o'clock news reflect either the totality or proportionality of those in reality i don't think it does your thoughts yeah, I mean, well, story selection bias is one of the biggest and most important kinds of bias that exists in the news. Obviously, you know, the easiest way to illustrate this is go to HuffingtonPost.com on one morning and then go to FoxNews.com on the same day. And the front pages of those two websites will be radically different, despite the fact they're trying to cover the exact same thing, you know, U.S. national politics and, and global political world. Um, they choose stories based on how they want their audience to feel on that day or what they want their audience to click on. So obviously, you know, a Fox News knows that if they cover a story about 50 migrants trying to cross the southern border, that's going to get a lot more clicks than the Huffington Post would get if they covered that exact same story. Um, you know, related to the crime numbers, it's an interesting point. I think, uh, you know, it's it's another reminder that even something that's supposed to be as straightforward as data can be really obscured. I mean, the the violent crime rise across the United States right now, I think, is a really complex thing. And I see a lot of people trying to sign it to, oh, the police are pulling back because of the defund the police movement. And it's like, yeah, I mean, maybe there's something there. Maybe that's something to do with it. But, you know, we also just went through a global pandemic where millions of people lost their jobs and anxiety was really high and people are using drugs more. And, you know, these are all things that contribute to crime rates. And so, um, you know, it's it's very rarely the black and white answer. I, I like to tell people, you know, look for the gray and you'll find some clarity, actually, believe it or not. And, you know, piggy, piggybacking on that, I, I think you hit the nail on the head, right? I mean, it's, it's complex. It's a bit more complex, but most of our reporters, including the, the, the regular mainstream media, and that's why a newsletter like yours is so important, because you go, go through and the machinations of both sides, or I shouldn't say both sides, it's really the machinations of all sides to actually try to discern 
where it's not commonality, but where the actual math exists. I always tell people BS in, BS out. If the FBI data looks like crap when it goes in because of who actually gets the numbers in there, the numbers that get out is going to be crap as well. Now, we take a look at something like Ukraine right now. Ukraine, it has the real sympathetic ear of the United States right now. And we really feel for those people who look like most Americans right now. And we cannot believe that those things are happening in Ukraine. And uh, I mean, worse, worse atrocities continue today to occur throughout the world that we don't see. Remember talking earlier about selectivity of stories, et cetera, what actually get covered and um, we, 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 don't, we don't see that. So we take a look and say, a lot of people immediately blame Americans and say, look at how Americans are. This, this white country in, in Europe gets nailed for who they care. When in, it, if we take a look at the totality, our media does not humanize elsewhere like they humanized Ukraine. You can't blame the average American populace for the impressions that they get from the fourth estate. And that's why I talk about the importance of what you do, the importance of what I do, because again, it's not easy to just go blame Americans for that's how they are, how Americans are. No, Americans are reflecting what the fourth estate presents to them. Your, your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I think it's a really great point. I mean, I actually just wrote a bit of a Twitter thread about this recently, which was, you know, the response that I saw, I think, was similar to the response you saw when there was this outpouring of love and support for Ukraine. There was a lot of people who were sort of shaming people who felt for Ukraine, saying, oh, where were you when, you know, bombs were being dropped on Yemen or in Iraq or Syria? And my message was, you know, this is an opening here. We have an opportunity where we're getting a clear view that when people are exposed to these kinds of horrors, it's really moving them. And instead of seeing that as an opportunity to shame somebody for feeling horrible about what's happening in Ukraine, use it as an opportunity, as an opening to realize that the more people who see these kinds of things happening across the world, the more humanity and empathy there will be for yes. them. And the greater our chances are of actually stopping war and stopping these things from happening in the future. And so don't spend your time shaming people. Spend your time saying, yes, you're right. This is terrible. We should always reject it when, you know, a country is dropping bombs on millions of innocent people and then hold everybody to that standard across the board in Yemen and Syria and Iraq. And that's how you sort of facilitate the change rather than, you know, making people feel horrible for, for having a feeling they should have, which is you should be horrified by what's happening in Ukraine. It's a terrible, horrible thing. Exactly right. You know, um, uh, I tell you what, doing what I do, I imagine doing what you do as well. Uh, you get to meet people of all stripes. And what I've really found out when I, you know, I tell people all the time, most people are good, right? And uh, I tell people that all the time. And everybody, you know, my, my audience is mixed. I mean, I'm very, very, I have liberals, progressives, uh, black, white, everything, big audience, right? That, that, that type of audience. And what I try to tell them as we talk together is that if we stop looking at each other as somehow what forces, and believe me, there are forces that need us to look at each other differently to keep the system alive, you need those forces. I said, if we start, I always talk about loving your brother on my show, my program, you know, if, if we just start thinking that kind of a way, you know what I mean? You'd start to see a whole lot of things change because my, when, when my right wingers come on and they, they name call me on my show, I look at them and say, hey, cool, brother, still love you, man. And understand that a lot of these things are externalities. A lot of these things come from abroad and start looking at people's humanity proper. A lot of these problems are solved. Yeah, no, I think it's a great point. I mean, I, uh, one of the things I really like to do when people ask me about you know, how do you talk about politics with people who you disagree with? Um, I get a lot of emails from, you know, readers who have an aunt or an uncle, or they have kids who are really politically opposite of them or friends even. And they just say, you know, I don't even know how to broach the conversation. And I'm like, this is such a golden opportunity. Most of us spend, you know, so much of our time arguing with people online and all this stuff, you know, you have a neighbor who has a big Trump flag out front. You don't know what his deal is or you're scared of him or whatever. 
go buy a six pack of beer and walk over there and knock on his door and tell me you want to chat, you know, and yes. that, that is how yes. you actually bridge the gap and change things. And in my personal life, it's, it's worked wonders. You know, I'll talk to anybody. I'll chat with anybody. I interview anybody. Um, because when you talk to people and you break down that stuff, you actually, you know, can ma make some progress out there in the world a little bit. We're almost coming to the end. I, I, I had a, 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 I used to go not all the time, but I actually got invited to a couple of, uh, tea, you remember the tea party days? Yeah. I'm going to yeah. honky tonky bars, drinking the tea <laughs> party, uh, you know, ha hanging out with these guys and talking, you know, uh, not, 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 a, not, not a problem, right? So, I mean, um, that beer thing works like a champ. I had a woman called me up, one of my, um, one of my listeners, and she said, Egberto, she lived in my part of town, and she said, Egberto, can we go out to coffee? I really need to talk to you about my family. I said, sure, let's go. So I went and had coffee with her, and what it was, it was Thanksgiving time, and she was going home with her family, and her family is racist. Her family or big Trump supporters and all of that. And she said, I, I don't want to go. I don't think I should go what you think or whatever. I told her, you need to go. And you know what? The first time they just said something, just say, I love you, man. We may disagree. Love you, man. You know? And she left there with a big smile on her face because I think one of the things is that she's so enlightened. She thought that it was almost doing something wrong by going to hang with her family who she knows was a racist bunch and i'm like no it's your family you know just go out there and you keep trying you know just go out there it does it it works and in the long run they will see what comes out of you and they'll change yeah and and to that point too i should add you know there are a lot of conservatives out there who are scared to speak their mind because they feel like they're going to be hated by people on the left and and you know, if you're a liberal and it sounds like maybe a lot of your audience is progressive, I mean, being able to hear somebody who is on the right espouse their political views and not immediately demonize them is a good way to earn their trust and make them more, you know, make them feel more comfortable and more vulnerable and more willing to talk out their side of things too, because just like there are a lot of people like that who are scared to go home to their, you know, Trump family or their racist family or whatever, there are a lot of conservatives out there who are scared to speak openly about their views because they're worried about getting canceled or screamed at or labeled a racist mm -hmm. or a bigot or whatever. And, uh, you know, we're just, we're really not talking to each other enough right now. It's a big that, problem. That is so true. Well, let me ask you, Isaac, last question is, um, and I asked this one to everybody on my show at the end, what would you have liked me to ask you that I didn't? Oh man, that's a great question. Uh, I would have liked you to ask me um, something about my political views changing, I think. That's always a good question. Well, you know, have at it. <laughs> well, I, I guess uh, to that point, you know, what I like to say when people ask about, you know, you one of the questions I get from a lot of people is you write this newsletter, you always talk about changing your political views, you know, where have your views actually changed today, I guess I had a little bit of an example that I'm going through this thing with the, the military funding, but um, one of the one of the political views that I've had really change, not I guess my political view hasn't changed, but I've become a lot less radicalized about it, is the issue of abortion, which I am a pretty still vehemently pro-choice. But in my experience writing this newsletter, I have interacted with a ton of readers who are anti-abortion, pro-life conservatives, and talking to them, emailing with them, writing with them, even having a phone call with a few I've realized that kind of the caricature that I've been fed of most pro-life Americans is actually just that. It's sort of like a really extremist version of these kind of really hateful, oftentimes super religious, very, very, very conservative Americans. And what I've found is that a lot of these people are just like really decent people. They, they don't want to control women's bodies. They just fundamentally want to you know, keep life. And, and I, and it's a much more relatable position from talking to them about it. And I've sort of come to realize that, um, 
you know, not every pro choice or not every pro life person out there is just like a raving religious zealot. A lot of them are actually not religious. A lot of them are Democrats. A lot of them are politically moderate. They just have this issue that they really care about, whether it's because of religion, whether it's a scientific thing that, you know, once they hear a heartbeat, they feel that means we should preserve the life. Um, and, and I just really come to kind of respect a lot of their I guess, motivations for that political view, even though I still disagree with them. And I think there's a lot of other reasons to disagree with them aside from just the really religious conservative stuff. But um, I've learned to have really productive conversations about it, which I never thought I'd be able to do since I think it's one of the hardest topics in the country right now. Prescient, prescient. I tell you, um, if I had more time, I would like, I would have told you about my Medicare for all story and a, a conservative, <laughs> a, a conservative woman ultimately coming up with that solution herself. And when realizing that she came up with the same solution that I did, who at that point she didn't know I was progressive said, but you're so nice. And the reason I'm saying that is you use the word caricature. Her belief of what a liberal or progressive looked like was a caricature. And like you just said there, once you start to talk to people, it's no longer about being a caricature, like you said. It's about just the humanity in all of us. Isaac, uh, Paul, I looked at, I, when I saw your name, I said, two <laughs> names out of the New Testament. Yeah, Isaac, but, <laughs> or maybe, maybe maybe the other thing as well. Maybe, maybe the, uh, the, the, what is it called again? Um, well, you know what I'm talking about. The Torah. The Torah. That's what, that's, I was trying, that's I was right. trying to get it. I I'm said, a good Jew, baby. Hey, but you know, <laughs> It is funny. It is funny because that's the first that after I said that, I'm said, no, maybe I should say the Torah, right? <laughs> then, hey, we we are we are people, man. We're people. Anyhow, Isaac Paul, it's been my pleasure to have you are a great interviewee, man. I I, I love your politics or non-politics, whatever the hell it is. And uh, you know, continue doing what you do with your newsletter. I think we need a whole lot more people out there that are presenting our politics the way you present our politics. Thank you so kindly for having been on Politics and Right. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. And if people want to check it out, go to readtangle.com and you can find the newsletter and, and soak it all in. All of it's going to be in the bottom of the blog, folks. Check it out. Thank you so kindly. Take Thank care, you, Isaac. Have a good one. We spend a lot of time deconstructing the news, trying to trying to parse it into a form that everybody can understand. We try to find those little nitpicks where uh, it goes, it flies above the fray, etc. If you really like these videos that we do, I want to ask a big favor. Please go ahead, number one, subscribe to our channel, and number two, please join if you can. Thank you so kindly for watching. Keep watching. Please remember to share. We must populate the entire internet with our progressive message, a message that we know is what most Americans say that they want. So help us please join.